Good morning. It's 8.30 on Tuesday, June 7th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, it's primary election day, and both major parties have contests in congressional districts throughout the state. We hear from party chairs about their outlook on the races. And the high cost of production with low milk prices are creating challenges for dairy farmers. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Polls are open in the midterm congressional primaries. Incumbents in all four districts are facing primary challenges with eyes on the general election in November. In the Republican Party, there are primary races in all four districts. The most widely contested of those, the race in the fourth, where a stable of candidates are vying for the nomination. With the National Party trying to regain a majority in Congress, Mississippi GOP Chairman Frank Bordeaux shares his out look on the election cycle with our Michael Guidry. I think that you're going to see a strong uh, get out the vote on the Republican side. All the candidates have worked very hard over the past several days of getting their votes out and just the disastrous policies that's coming from the uh, Democrats on a national basis, I think has really got Republican voters motivated to show up to vote. So we're hoping that Mississippi does as other states have done and have a huge turnout. The fourth congressional district in southern Mississippi uh, is is widely contested. It's, it's not completely unusual for an incumbent to to you know get a challenger or two. How do you manage to to kind of stay out of something when when it seems like a district like that uh, becomes uh, the the target of so many you know potential candidates? Well, I think our slate. Uh, you know, this is my home area. Uh, I am in the fourth. And so I kind of live it every day. Uh, we have a, a great slate of uh, candidates uh, that are running. Uh, I know all of them very well. Uh, I'm friends with all of them. And I think, you know, uh, for whatever reason, uh, they were in, uh, have decided to run for office. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens tomorrow um, as far as the fourth is concerned. But uh, for the most part, it's been a, a good, clean race. I do expect all of the uh, candidates that are running to coalesce behind uh, whoever is the victor um, come uh, tomorrow or if there were to be a runoff after the runoff. So uh, I, there, I don't see a, any sort of division in the party in South Mississippi. I, I think you just have a lot of motivated folks that were interested in running for Congress. If someone were to go to the Republican Party website, there's uh, a, a page that has a, a nice extensive list of, you know, platform policy goals and, and ideals. Uh, and one of the things that isn't really mentioned on it at all is the, the former president. Yet when it comes to some of the rhetoric used, the, there, there's a lot of um, con- trying to connect candidates to the former president. Is there a path for Mississippi Republicans uh, independent of, uh, I guess, this connection with the former president? Is there a place for, you know, a strictly policy based campaign looking forward to the generals rather than one tied to the personality of of a former of a former president? I'm not sure that everybody that's trying to um, connect themselves or that the former president has connected themselves to is just purely on uh, popularity. I believe that his policies or something that a lot of Republicans are very proud of. Obviously, uh, former President Trump has a big place in our party, and there's others in our party that have a huge place, and they do follow the platform of the Mississippi Republican Party and the National Republican Party. And I believe that most Mississippians do identify with uh, our policies of less government, less regulation. Obviously, uh, we're seeing the you know a lot. Uh, it, it's it's gone from bad to worse. Uh, nationally led by a Democrat in the White House and a Democrat Congress. And Americans and Mississippians are seeing those disastrous policies, how they're affecting their daily lives, and how their daily lives were affected uh, for the for the better when President Trump was in office. And so I don't know whether or not endorsements help or hurt. Uh, you know, that's, that's for the political uh, strategists to decide. But um, I, I don't see reaching out to or, or tying yourself to former President Trump is just tying yourself to him as an individual. I believe it's tying yourself to his uh, successful policies. Yeah, as you've mentioned, um, I mean, right now, the the 
the Republican Party in the state carries three of the four districts. But in Congress, uh, the party is a minority in, in the House of Representatives. It's an even split in the Senate with lots of contested seats up nationally. I guess looking beyond the primary to the general, once the once the dust has settled for your party, what, what are your policy solutions for the Mississippi Republican Party going into the general once once these primaries are over? Well, I think, you know, obviously, if we can uh, go back to uh, the Trump policies that uh, President Biden immediately after taking office signed executive orders to reverse several of the policies, um, stay in Mexico, you know, building our border wall, taking care of that issue, obviously, taking care of our oil and gas uh, leases, opening up those leases, opening up pipelines, uh, becoming more energy independent as we were under the Trump administration. And I believe taking a serious uh, look at our supply uh, supply chain issues. I think that we could have uh, gotten to work on that a lot sooner than uh, what the Biden administration. I think that they still failed to address that as a huge issue. And so uh, moving forward, I think there's a lot of things that the Republican Party, we don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel. The wheel was rolling. And the Biden administration very quickly after taking office dismantled uh, policies that were working for Americans. Frank Bordeaux is chairman of the Mississippi Republican Party. Coming up, the chair of the Mississippi Democratic Party on defining success this election season. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Mississippi Democrats hold only one congressional seat, but are looking to gain ground in the deeply red state. For Chairman Tyree Irving, this whole election cycle is a chance to measure progress towards tilting the state blue. He shares more with our Michael Guidry. When I became chair of the party almost two years ago, I, I said that uh, my vision uh, is to turn Mississippi blue. Now, that will not happen um, overnight. It will not happen in a year or two. Um, but it will never happen unless we start. Uh, uh, in order to do just that, uh, turn this state blue, um, it's a long-term proposition. Now, whether we are uh, successful in, in November uh, is not going to deter us uh, in any uh, way at all. This is not about running just to have somebody running. This is about laying the groundwork for changing this state. We have to come up with a really good message that hits home, and we have to horn that message and explain it uh, to Mississippians, what it is that Democrats have done and are doing uh, that makes their life better. Well, when you talk about turning the state blue uh, and you you talk about solving problems, uh, what are the issues that you are focusing on, you and the party are focusing on, and what are those policy solutions that you're offering uh, to try to attract people to the party? Well, let me ask you this. What does the Republican offer? Absolutely nothing. So if we offer anything, we're doing better than what they are doing. They have you 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 you've heard you've not heard anything that is that the Republicans have offered to make life better for anybody. We're going to elect Democrats over time. That's going to change the complexion uh, of the state house. And when you get people in office uh, who are uh, concerned about their uh, the fellow, uh, well, uh, fellow Mississippians, since we're talking about uh, Mississippi here, um, they will then enact legislation uh, that will uh, have the, uh, the long-term effect of, of, of changing things around. For example, we got to continue to improve our, uh, the quality of our education. We got to make sure uh, that uh, education uh, uh, is. Um, uh, well, I should say our educational institutions are partnered with industry so that when we graduate kids, uh, there is a, a need uh, for what uh, they have been 
and uh, taught and, and the skills that they have learned in school. It, it's so much. Anything we do is better than uh, what we have uh, right now. You've got uh, rural hospitals uh, closing down, can't provide medical service. The legislature has had an opportunity to expand uh, a, a medical care for people who can't afford it, but they have not done it. Uh, we're going to elect them who are going to uh, have the concern of ordinary Mississippians' uh, need for adequate uh, medical care uh, met. Uh, so it's not something, you know, it's not a magic wand that we say we can do in one or uh, two uh, election cycles. It's about Mississippi didn't get near the bottom overnight either. It's been a situation of neglect for years for years, decades, uh, and it's not going to crawl out. We're not going to be able to pull it out overnight either, but we've got to start. You know, you're focused on the primaries and making sure the primaries run smoothly. Looking ahead to November, since you know this is a big-picture plan uh, that you say you have for the party, uh, what would be a small-step victory um, uh, in November once these once the primaries are done, your candidates for the, the general are set, and November comes around, what will be, uh, in your estimation, uh, what's what's one of those small step victories that show you that the progress is being made uh, towards uh, the goals you've stated? If we have people working, uh, trying to be a, a get elected, whether they get elected or not this term, does not mean that we are not making progress. You don't measure success, in my judgment, uh, necessarily by whether you win uh, any or everything that you go at uh, when you first make the effort. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, when you make the effort, I let, for example, I think um, uh, Governor William Winter ran for governor several times before he was finally elected governor. Uh, Republicans, for example, ran for years uh, before F- Fordyce uh, eventually uh, broke through and got elected governor. So my point I'm making is when you are uh, when you are out of power, it doesn't mean that you are not uh, making progress uh, simply because you may or may not win uh, in an election. The question is uh, <clears throat> is whether or not you did all you could do at that moment in that uh, situation. And if it didn't bear fruit then, it will bear fruit if you continue to work at it. Tyree Irving is the chairman of the Mississippi Democratic Party. Coming up, high input costs, production costs, and low milk prices are creating challenges for dairy farmers. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. High production costs and low milk prices are causing challenges for dairy farmers across the U.S. But dairy specialist Amanda Stone with the Mississippi State Extension Service says Mississippi farmers, dairy farmers, are being hit especially hard. She breaks it down with MPB's Michael Guidry. What we are seeing in the industry as a whole is that prices, input prices, so prices for fertilizer, for feed, you know, for everything to allow the cows to produce the milk that you then eventually see on the shelves has skyrocketed. So we're seeing all of that ourselves, but when you need that to be able to put it into your system that then outputs the the milk, we're not seeing an increase in milk prices high enough to compensate for the increased input prices. Does that make sense? It, yeah, it does. It does make sense. Um, so on the, the consumer price part of it, is it, you know, even though these, these production costs are rising, uh, are we seeing those, those prices for consumers stay relative because the, the, the market won't allow it to go higher? Yes, it is. And that's one of the complicated um, issues with milk in general. Um, with 
some other dairy products like cheese, you know, hard cheeses in particular that are a little bit more um, stable that can not quite as perishable, but still perishable, right? But with fluid milk and, and really most dairy products, they, they have an expiration. So you have to move those products before they expire or it's a, a waste of really everybody's time and, and money. Um, so it is a, a balancing act for the retailers to make sure that they are moving what they have on the shelves and not ordering more than what they are needing. And then for the processors to not produce more than what is needed, right? And so they are moving, the, the dairy processors are, are moving milk all across the country to make sure that it is going where it's needed. So like in Mississippi, for example, we are in a milk deficit state. So that means that we consume more milk than we produce. So we need to actually get milk from other places. And in general, milk flows from north to south. So we get ours from more northern states. And so whenever we're getting more milk, it has to come from these other areas, be processed, put on the shelf. And if we're not consuming that amount, then we're not only messing with Mississippi dairy producers, but we're, you know, it has kind of a, a wave effect of, affecting other areas also but there's a point where people will buy less milk and retailers use milk as a loss leader because milk is what gets people into the store so you'll notice that milk is always in the very back corner of a store and they do that so that you walk through the aisles so retailers are really not making money off of milk now or really ever um, and I don't intend to see changes happening there anytime soon but that is kind of part of the issue that messes with the prices is that retailers aren't really willing to increase the price by a ton and then that affects the, the processors who then affect the producers is there a tipping point um i mean we we've we've seen a level of inflation uh f- for a sustained period of time here, there has been a decline in dairy production in the state uh, over time as it is. But is there a tipping point uh, as far as you know how long producers in the state and even producers regionally uh, and and the supply chains to Mississippi can sustain this before there are you know, serious uh, you know, effects? Yes, um, but it depends <laughs> on each farm, right? So there's a tipping point for each individual farm, how long they can hold on, basically. Um, You know, before COVID hit, we were really already reaching a four-year low milk price um, time period. And right as COVID was hitting, we were actually starting to see milk prices increase. And then COVID hit and the supply chain just crashed and schools closed, restaurants closed. And those were huge supporters of the dairy industry because Kids drink a lot of milk in schools and restaurants use a lot of milk and cheese and cream, right? Um, So we saw a crash when we were actually finally expecting to see kind of that light at the end of the tunnel of of a horrible four-year period. So dairy producers are not only affected by what we're seeing now. It's been going on for a really long time. And for a lot of producers, these last two years were kind of just the the straw that broke the camel's back that they just could not recover from because you can only hold on for so long, right? Regardless of what your business is. And if they are holding on to their farm and trying to keep it going with the hope that, you know, eventually things are going to look up, we're going to start making money again, and then they never do, then eventually they do have to throw in the towel because they risk not just losing their dairy farm, but losing the land that their ancestors, you know, purchased and had farms on and stuff. So there is a tipping point, and I would say for a lot of producers, we are past it um, or just reaching it because they have been going on for years. So there's only so much time that they can sustain something like that. The milk that Mississippi producers produce and that is purchased by these co-ops, what is the primary use for it? I mean, is this being processed into, you know, consumable milk or is it being uh, processed to use to, to, to do other things like create cheese, sour cream, other other dairy products? Mm-hmm. Yeah, almost all of the milk produced in Mississippi goes to fluid milk production. So the gallon and half gallon jugs you're going to see at the grocery store. 
Um, other states are going to make more. So like Wisconsin, you think of cheese, right? And that's because they produce a lot of cheese. And that's something that they can haul down to us. But because we're a milk deficit state, almost all of our milk goes into just fluid milk production. You'll see Mississippi um, branded cheese and ice cream and stuff on shelves sometimes that is um, processed by the farm themselves. So on-farm processing is what that's called. So those producers don't sell to a milk cooperative. They process it into whatever products they're making on their actual own farm and then sell it. When people go to the like a grocery store around here, whether it's a you know a, a you know a, a smaller local store or a big chain store, does the product they buy themselves have any impact on 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 the local dairy farm economy? Or basically, can they assume that if they're buying milk, whatever the brand name is in Mississippi, that it that it has close ties to Mississippi production? Yes. Yeah, so you can actually look where, at what state your um, milk was processed in there's a website that you can just search for it and it will tell you the code so that you'll you probably have never really looked on your on your milk but it has some some code on it with some numbers and some letters and it will tell you those first two numbers um, are where that milk was processed so you can look for that and buy mississippi based milk but mostly everything you're going to be buying in our grocery stores down here is is probably made by our producers or coming in from the north. Um, So you purchasing milk, particularly fluid milk, but all dairy products, is going to increase the demand for it, which then increases, you know, the the help that our dairy producers need. So the cost we've already talked about in a grocery store doesn't reflect what the producers are getting. But if we see declines, continued declines in consumption, then that makes cooperatives need less milk, which then makes them cut off dairy producers. So if we continue to buy dairy products and increase our consumption of dairy products, then that allows our producers to continue doing what they are doing. Amanda Stone, dairy specialist with the Mississippi State Extension Service. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate your interest. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Money Talks. Then at 10, it's in legal terms. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. Join us tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi Edition only on MPB Think Radio. Have a nice day.